welcome to the QSD of a child episode 26 mm-hmm. another big delay in our uh, recording schedule yeah but we're gonna try release episodes every three to four weeks now <laughs> in theory yep um it, it's funny it's working from home and homeschooling actually seems to make it harder you'd think yeah. we'd have more time but we don't before we begin the show, I just want to go over a really cool looking new app called Polybook, which um, we've been testing out a little bit. And what it does is it allows you to store facts about things you know. Um, and different shows and podcasts or blogs can also add facts to their content. And when you collect them, um, you can view them on a timeline or by location and kind of lots of cool other factors. It's been done in conjunction with Brunel University and their, I think their Cognitive Sciences Department there to really understand um, how people remember and recall information. So it's much better than, I know, liking tweets and things where those soon get lost into the ether, don't they? Yeah. And I had a chat with Joe, um, who's, whose idea the project is on Zoom the other day. He's a really nice chap. And so definitely check out Polybook by going to polybook.app. It's still in testing at the moment, um, so there's going to be lots of new features to come soon. Yeah, I think it's a much better way than just um, reading articles. It's a bit more interactive and more fun. Yeah, well, I'd link off to the articles, so it's a way to find those articles again and Mm -hmm. that kind of extra depth and information. Yeah. So we've been adding facts about our shows, haven't we? Yeah. Speaking of which... On with the show. On with the show. So when I was planning this episode, it was around Chinese New Year. So I was thinking, let's do something on ox and oxen. Yeah, because that's it's the year of the ox. It is, but um, that's a little while ago now. Um, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> I remember from school, just coming across oxen when we were doing things like uh, crop rotation and then ploughing fields in medieval times. And then then the ox, they just seem to disappear and vanish. Yeah. And um, the only time you ever come across them now seems to be oxtail soup. (laughs) Well, at least I hope it's the tail that they're putting in that soup. Yeah, not the um, bit on the other side. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, So that got me thinking kind of what exactly are oxen? Because we've never really been told at school. And I was wondering, are they a specific type of bovine animal or are they something else? So I decided to dig into it a bit further. But it's quite interesting how we have these holes in our knowledge, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's just like you think you know something or know something similar, but you don't. I didn't know what oxen were properly. So, Anton, do you know what oxen are? Um, they're a bit like cows, I think. Um, or... Yeah, a bit like cows. Okay, yeah, that's that's not bad. But well, I'm going to go over what they are, how they're used, a um, bit of folk stories about them and a bit of history and uh, just some general oxen love. Oxen love. Okay, so there's two main ways of looking at oxen. Now, there's the first broader way, which is basically they're, they're, they're cattle. So they're cows, bulls, so bovine creatures, things that go moo. Um <laughs> Exactly. Um, and it's when they're used as a draft animal, okay? Mm-hmm. So draft animals, they're typically um, animals that are used for pulling heavy loads on the farm, such as different equipment like ploughs and things or wheeled vehicles. So today we usually think of horses, at least we do in the West. Yeah, horses, maybe donkeys or something. Yeah, mules. Uh, it could even be a camel yeah. if you're like, around a sandy area. Maybe llamas and stuff in South mm-hmm. America. So I've got some pictures here. Which <laughs> that looks like a notes. Santa's sleigh. It is. It's a Santa's sleigh of cows. Oh, that's cool. They're wearing... They, they look like they're wearing helmets, but they're just wearing hats with their horns coming out the sides. Yeah, so that'd be the type of yoke that they'd have there. So if you can see, there's a cross piece. So the yoke was um, how you would basically join the animals together and that they would use for pulling... Um, whatever bit of equipment they had behind them. So they're different stars. And this one, as you pointed out, kind of goes over the horns. Mm-hmm. Because it's quite a powerful creature, isn't it? Could you um, use those hats to show, like, which oxen are yours? I'd imagine they'd have some sort of markings on them or yeah. something. Yeah. Although you quite often brand animals as well. Yeah. And I think you like this one. This is in Sweden, this picture. We'll I put quite it in the like that. It's, it's a pretty fat cow thingy or ox. Yeah, being ridden by a man. Mm -hmm. It's pretty stubby as well. (laughs) 
So can you imagine a wild cow? Um, not quite. No, it's not the sort of creature you ever think of being wild, do you? No. Well, there were aurochs, and they were pretty mean animals, but they went extinct in Europe around 1627, and they were really large and powerful. And Julius Caesar even wrote about them in his commentaries, and he said, They are little below the size of an elephant, and of appearance, colour, and shape of a bull. Their strength and speed are extraordinary. They spare neither man nor wild beast, which they have espied. So that sounds pretty dangerous. Mm-hmm. I bet Julius Caesar wished he tamed one of them as like a weapon. Yeah. So I've got another picture here just to show you. Um, so our cows that we have today, their uh, ancestors could be pretty wild. So here's one fighting off some wolves. Yeah, the wolves are tiny. And one of them's, one of them's just been flipped over. Well, you've got to think of things like um, bison and buffalo, because they're relatives as well. Think how big they are. So these were Mm -hmm. probably halfway between the two. Now, cattle, they're first domesticated around 4000 BCE, and they were in common use in Mesopotamia over 5000 years ago, um, when agriculture and farming really took off. So we've had a really long history together. Um, So do you know where Mesopotamia is? Um... In Mesopotamia. <laughs> now I've got a map here for you. So Mesopotamia, it's basically modern day Iraq. Um, mm. And also kind of spanning into Iran and Syria and going up into Turkey. And it's between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. So if you do any Roman history, um, you'll come across those a lot. Uh, as the Romans kind of went invading into the Persian Empire and all sorts there many many times and it was a really fertile area we look at it today and think it's all desert but it's actually one of the hearts of modern um well, greenery <laughs> modern, <laughs> yeah well of early civilization it's, it's yeah. amazing um, is that where near where um what's it called i can't remember now never mind babylon yeah yes yeah yeah so babylon was I th- here somewhere yeah i say pointing to the map I'm <laughs> just pointing out. Oh, there we go. There's Babylon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Babylon was right between the two rivers. Mm-hmm. So, so quite a good place. Just south of modern-day Baghdad. Mm-hmm. Anyway, back to oxen. So remember, I said it had two meanings. So we've done the broad definition of it's just a type of cattle. A work cattle or something, or a draft cattle. That's what you're Yeah, saying. yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there's also a more specific subsection than that. And I'm going to use some technical lingo here, okay? Mm-hmm. On intact bulls. Okay? So, you know a cow and a bull? Mm-hmm. So, do you know what I mean by that? No. Okay. On intact bulls have on intact bulls. Okay. Do you get it now? Yes. <laughs> so, can you explain that to me? Um, no. <laughs> I was going to say you might want to sit down for this bit, and we are actually uh, sitting down this time recording. So many oxen are castrated males, and that means they've had their testicles removed. Okay. Yeah? Are you okay with this? Yes. (laughs) Good. So you're probably wondering why that happens, aren't you? No. No? To stop smaller cows. Cowlets. Oh, to stop. There would be some of it, yeah. Um, But I'll go into a bit more. And say that the people don't accidentally milk the wrong thing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) Right. Um, Okay, I'll go into a bit more. I want you to close your eyes, please. Imagine you're in Spain in a large arena. The crowd is roaring and cheering, the hot sun hitting you. The baking interior of the bowl-shaped coliseum in which you're seated. You're waiting for the big show to begin. A man stands in the middle, dressed in extravagant clothes, brightly coloured and decorated with gold patterns. In his hand, he holds a red cloth, a muleta, and performs to the crowd. The sound of metal, scraping metal, echoes across the arena. A gate is drawn open along its edge, and a large, powerful bull strides into the dusty earth. The matador turns and salutes the onlookers, dramatically flourishing his red cloth. With this, the crowd's fever reaches another level, as the spectacle is about to begin. Dun, dun, dun! So you can imagine a bullfight, can't you? So how would you describe the bull in a bullfight? Um, I think it would be very angry and raged. 
Yeah, they're ferocious and powerful, mm-hmm. aren't they? And they just charge up red. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So obviously during a bullfight, the animal's been deliberately agitated and, and tormented to make them particularly angry. Uh, but bulls are really powerful. They're kind of a block of moss and horns. They're really dangerous. Um, so do you want a creature like that pulling a plough across the field for you? Yeah, sounds good. What, so dangerous? Yeah. You sure? Yes. Okay, maybe on your farm you will. Generally most sane people want an animal that's a little bit more... Uh, quiet and controlled and easier to manage and one way you can do that is to lop off the testicles any idea why that might help because then they have less courage Uh, in a way yeah it comes mostly down to hormones with the main one being testosterone which is produced in the testicles no no not wee wee i know (laughs) It's something that you are going to become very familiar with over the next few years as uh, you go into adolescence. <laughs> Your face. <laughs> Sorry, this might be quite uncomfortable for you. Um, so basically, when a bull um, has no testicles, it can't produce testosterone and becomes much more docile and less aggressive and much easier to manage. So it becomes a better farm animal when you want it to pull plows, yeah? Mm-hmm. Do you understand now? Yes. Now, I'm going to give you a choice. Do you want to know how the procedure is done or not? Yeah, for the for the viewers or listeners. For the listeners, okay. You are doing a sacrifice here for the listeners. Don't worry, I won't be demonstrating on you. I'm just going to show you a few tools and techniques that I managed to find because I, I, I found an entire guide to uh, bull castration online. Okay. Don't worry, the diagrams, they're just simple line drawings I found for you here, okay? Nothing too graphic. Okay. Like a photo or anything. <laughs> so this is called the elaster tool, and as you can see, it uses rubber rings mm-hmm. and what looks like almost like a pair of uh, oh. pliers or something. And it stretches out an elastic band, bland, bland <laughs> an elastic a band, and you can probably imagine where that elastic band is placed. <laughs> so you know when you've wrapped an elastic band around your finger too tight, yeah, what happens to it? It goes purple. <laughs> yeah, so and then br- eventually it drops off. It would drop off exactly. I've got another tool here, which looks more like a very stylized um, set of garden shears. It looks a bit like a clench or something. A clench? Yeah, a clench. Is that like a clamp? Yeah, a clench. <laughs> I quite like that. That should be a, a tool called a clench. <laughs> okay, so I'll put those in the show notes. Um, anyway, after the procedure is performed the, and the poor creature has recovered, it's ready for a hard life on the farm. I'm not going to pass judgment on whether I think it's right or wrong or not, because it's been so much a part of human development to reach the point we have uh, as we've basically transformed animals into um, sort of draft animals or effectively tools for us. They're they're like pets, but work pets. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And it's still really important in some parts of the world, such as Southeast Asia. But if it is done, I I hope it's done in the best, quickest, least painful way it can be. Yeah, so you just make them drop off. Yeah. If you think about cattle, when we breed them, uh, we've got the females, which we generally use for milk. And we're going to have, we want lots of them, don't we, Mm -hmm. for doing that? But the birth rates can be about 50-50 boys and girls. So we need to do something with the male ones, don't we? Yeah, chop them up and eat them. Chop them up and eat them, yeah. Or turn them into draft animals. Oh, yeah. That's what we've been talking about. Exactly. Do they hook like the, um, some stuff onto their horns and then that's how they carry them? Carry what? I don't know, the ploughs or whatever. That's what the yake was. Oh. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and then they'd also use uncastrated animals or female cows as draft animals as well. Also, as a farmer, you want to selectively choose your best bulls for reproduction. So Choose your best bulls for reproduction. Exactly, your best bulls, and then the not-so-good bulls you would discard. <laughs> Put them aside. Yes. Now, if you think back to the start of the feature... Um, for me, oxen were something that turned up briefly in school when looking at the agricultural revolution of the 17th to 19th century. Although I said medieval at the start, it's actually a bit later than that as well. But And as you know, they were used long before that throughout the world. What really transformed this was the yoke, which is what you just asked about. Mm-hmm. And it really allowed us to harness the power of cattle. 
Now, the animals, they usually worked in pairs. And you'd have a yoke, which is a sort of device that sits around their neck. Yeah. Or in the case of the photo earlier. Is it like a leash sort of thing? A little bit, but a yoke, if you look at it here, it's kind of a wooden, kind of firmer brace that goes around them. So it's, it's more basic than what you'd have on a horse or something. Mm-hmm. And that's actually important because you could, it's a more primitive attachment. You could imagine it being used a long time ago before proper horse harnesses were developed. And um, it's not actually very good for using horses because just their body shape isn't good. So they've got a longer neck. Yeah. And you can't use a yoke on a horse. So you would have a, a harness um, with horses that was developed later. Yeah. The word yoke is believed to have come from the ancient proto Indo European languages and it means to join or link. Hmm. Not just the middle bit of an egg. No, no. <laughs> So as I said, yokes are not very effective with horses, which is one of the reasons why for so long um, cows and bulls and things were favoured until harnesses were developed for horses. Yeah. There is one time when you do need a harness for an ox, though, and that's when shoeing them. Because unlike horses, they don't balance well on three legs, so you need all sorts of fancy contraptions for holding them up. Mm-hmm. So you, you kind of put a um, kind of straps or something underneath their stomach, and you'll be able to raise them up into the air. Yeah. And uh, so they wouldn't fall over. So don't go cow tipping, please. Whilst researching this, I did find some hot debate over whether oxen or horses were better. Some people favoured horses, saying they were more powerful, but others argued that oxen had more strength. What I do know, though, is that horses began to gain popularity and push out oxen over time. But horses can be more expensive to keep and harder to look after and feed than cattle, so they didn't make a good choice for the rural peasantry of Europe. How different the running costs between the two are is debatable, though. A Scottish farmer in the 1840s said about ploughing, The amount and value of work performed by each are equal. (laughs) However, Arthur Young in the 18th century found that horses cost four times that of oxen. But 16th century French soil scientist and author, Elie de Sears, said a horse moves more earth in one day than an ox does in four. But, Lord Cames wrote, in his 1776 work, The Gentleman Farmer, (laughs) an attempt to improve agriculture by subjecting it to the text of rational principles. Among the ancients, we read of no beasts for the draught but oxen. So it was in Greece at the early days of Hesedon. The Dutch at the Cape of Good Hope plough with oxen and exercise them early to a quick pace, as so to be equal to horses in the wagon as well as the plough. They are used in the East Indies for carrying burdens, and they are fitter than ever for that service. The back of an ox being convex and able to support a weight more than a horse. Maybe an oxen could carry a horse in its back. Well, maybe, yeah. Maybe a combination of two is what we need. Mm-hmm. Just like half horse, half oxen. Yeah. Now, Cames, he was a principal figure in the Scottish Enlightenment, and he tried to apply scientific rigour to his findings. He goes on to say, Nothing is more deeply in their interest than to lay aside horses totally in their own interests and employ oxen. So he was really Mm pro-oxen. And he even compared the merits of oxen and horse poo, with the former being excellent at improving pastures, and the latter burning it to where it fell. It's a deadly, flaming horse poo. (laughs) His only reason for horses being used in Britain? Bad roads, unsuitable for carts. Because the farmers had to carry their corn to market on horseback, as no one thought to create proper furniture for the back of an ox. (laughs) Yeah, so um, you can kind of stick things on a horse's back easier than an ox's back, it seems. Mm Mm-hmm. So basically, this debate has been going on for centuries. There are some other differences as well, because oxen can tolerate drought uh, much better than horses due to their third stomach, the rumen, which stores water. However, heat and dust can be a killer for them. And in the spring 2015 issue of Overland Journal, Dixon Ford and Lee Kruitzer... Kruitzer. Kruitzer? Kruitzer? (laughs) Um, covered the use of oxen in America in great detail. 
Now, this is during the age of the pioneers, okay? So think of people emigrating further west across the prairies and the mountains. So cowboy times, yeah? Yeehaw! Which you would have seen on TV. Mm-hmm. And Ford, he actually reenacted some of the old wagon trails for a documentary. And uh, he noted that the worst enemy they ever had was dust. Dust killed more oxen than engines or snake bites or anything else did. And cattle don't sweat. And if you've ever ridden a horse, you'll know that they do. <laughs> he continued, The exterior muscles, the leg muscles, the back, and all those muscles could be very hot, much above the normal body temperatures. But the heart and the lungs have to be kept cool by breathing. The dust on the trails starts to coat the oxen's nose and nostrils, so he can't cool that air. So this means that they really start struggling to breathe as, and the mucus builds up, blocking their noses. And you can probably picture big strands of uh, mucus and snot hanging down from a cow's nose. I can, but I don't want to. <laughs> but luckily for the cattle, boys like yourself, Anton, they would carry a rag with them. Oh, that's... And they would use it for unblocking the nostrils. Just, like, get a towel, shove it up there, start twisting. Pretty much, yeah. yeah or nice maybe you can stick it up one and it comes out the other. <laughs> Could do, yeah. Like a, like a bull's ring. Exactly. Yes. <clears throat> we figured it out. Actually, you could put a, a cloth on the ring and twist it around. That's true. But only if it's big enough. Mm. Like, the hole's big enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so between 1840 and 1869, approximately 300,000 people crossed the United States. Now, in film, you usually see them being pulled by horses. But in reality, maybe as many as three quarters of the draft animals were actually oxen. And the journey west was about 2,000 miles or 3,200 kilometers and could take up to five months. And these amazing animals pulled the carts the whole way. And just thinking the carts was all of the possessions that the owner had, like everything they owned in the world was being towed with them. Mm -hmm. So you can understand why. You need those boys to clear up the <laughs> Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and also the bonds that would form between animal and owner. Mm -hmm. However, sometimes uh, the animals would escape and go missing, and then the owners would return to that location days later, hoping to find them again. Uh -huh. uh, but obviously, many times they didn't. And then other times, they might need to abandon the animal, maybe because they'd run out of food or something, or maybe it's like hurt its leg or something. Yeah. And uh, there's one story I found which tells of travellers finding an oxen with a note attached to it saying, Please don't abuse her, as she's been one of the best. <laughs> So you can see kind of real love there for the animal. Mm -hmm. So they're probably really sad to leave it behind. But the horse, as you know, it's a bit of a status symbol, isn't it? Who likes to ride a horse? Um, posh people. Yeah, <laughs> it's a sign of wealth. Yeah. As a rider, you're high above the masses and you kind of show off that you can afford such a beast. You can look down your nose. Exactly, yeah. And it's not all clogged up with <laughs> no. mucus. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, so knights, kind of the nobles, they'd ride them into battle, wouldn't they? And they'd be finely clothed and armoured. Mm -hmm. I heard this somewhere, they used to be a little bit smaller. So you imagine knights running into battle in little uh, Shetland, Shetland ponies. ponies yeah. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> so maybe not quite as spectacular. Uh, I, was, I was about to do... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that was. That, that was an alien horse. That, that was meant to be a... <laughs> a <laughs> but high pitch. <laughs> How do you? No. So, if you were a farmer, having horses and not oxen is a real sign of wealth and status. I've got a map of France here from 1882, which shows the percentage of oxen to horses as draft animals. And it reveals that in the poorer areas, or the poorer rural, the poorer rural areas, oxen still commanded about 70 to 80% usage. So that's the darker like the black bits yeah. yeah and um well in the richer areas the more market orientated regions horses were dominant and they might be all the way to nearly a um 100 percent usage yeah like that's more in the northage kind of bit mm -hmm. yeah so it just goes to show that if people could afford horses they would favor them yeah but maybe they might have had a couple of oxen as well for like heavy lifting or really, really heavy stuff. Possibly, yeah. Or maybe just to, like, punish their child, their boys. Oh, what, cleaning the nose? Yep. <laughs> 
So at the start of the show, I mentioned Chinese New Year. And yes, I know we're a bit late for that now. Uh, but in Asia, oxen have been very important too. And in the north of China, they're typically the base genus, um, which is similar to the cows you'd find in Europe. Whilst in the wetter south, um, you find more water buffalo there. And they are a related kind of species. Oh, so okay? the amphibious... Um Troop transport. Yeah, the, that's right, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You carry a jeep. And water buffalo, they're the perfect animal for the rice paddies, where other creatures or machinery would struggle. So you've seen photos of rice paddies, haven't you? Yeah, and I've seen photos with oxen or water buffalo as well inside. Exactly, yeah. So you might either get like large flat fields with the water or you get the tiered ones, don't you? Which would be really hard for... Um, you couldn't use a tractor on those. No, definitely not. Otherwise, it would just uh, fall down and get really wet as well. Yeah. Full of rice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also in India, a 1998 report estimated that there are about 65.7 million oxen in use. And about half the world's food production is dependent on animals for land preparation. So that shows how important draft animals still are today. It's not just something from ancient times. Yeah, and then the other half is where the animals live and then get chopped up and then processed or whatever and then eaten. Oh, nice. (laughs) It's important to remember that the numbers here, it's not just the oxen that have been snipped, okay? (laughs) It's all the ones, like the broader definition. So there'd be like female... Mm-hmm. Cattle there and uncastrated bulls, right? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Oh, it reminds me actually, when I was at school, um, we were doing, I had some science homework. Oh, wow. And we had to write about um, a bullock. But unfortunately, I, I've never been good at spelling and I substituted the first vowel in the word with another one, a more circular one. And um, <laughs> I had a message from the teacher saying, uh, like, great work, but what's your spelling? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so in honour of this amazing animal who has long been part of the human story, who has helped us transform culture and society, allowed us to work the lands and produce more food, freeing people to pursue other ideas, and being immortalised in the stars as Taurus and the Chinese Zodiac. Let's end with a story. Yay. Story time. Time to go to sleepy. (laughs) As it's getting near bedtime. (laughs) How the Heavenly Ox Came to Earth According to a myth told through the ages by Chinese peasants, there used to be no oxen on earth at all. There were no animals that would help till the land. The oxen lived in heaven with the emperor as the ox stars. But down on the earth, the people were hungry and starving. Taking pity on them and wishing to help, the emperor sent the oxen down to earth with a message. If they worked hard, they'd starve no more, and they would have a meal at least once every three days. But the oxen, perhaps disorientated at being on Earth after spending so much time in the stars, got the message wrong. Instead, he told the people that the Emperor of Heaven had promised them three meals a day if they worked hard. (laughs) This obviously caused the Emperor a bit of a problem. This promise was impossible to keep, as the people, no matter how hard they worked, would be able to make that much food, and he did not want to be seen as a liar. (sighs) So, to punish the oxen for this mistake, he banished it to earth, where it would work the lands hard every day in order to keep this promise. And that is why oxen are such hard workers to this day. I like that. Yeah, it's a nice little story, isn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. So I want you to take a moment to think about the first oxen and the countless others that have followed it. There must be so few animals, indeed anything else, in history that has had such a great impact on the development of humans and our Mm -hmm. culture. But that has also been so overlooked. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, so you don't think... Particularly in the West, where we don't see them so much now. I imagine in China or India or somewhere where they're used more, um, that they're respected more. But for us, a cow's a cow and it's seen as dumb. And I think I think that cows should be in zoos. <laughs> Why? Because we don't see them usually. Well, we've got beautiful cows over yeah, here. Yeah, Guernsey cows. Yeah, best milk in the world as well. Best fudge in the world. We're going to do an episode on Guernsey cows one day. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. let's see if I can contact that farm again. Yeah, so make sure that you thank all the oxen of the world because some of them have been through a lot of snipping <laughs> and they need their appreciation. And um, I think that's probably another show. Yeah. Did you enjoy that? Yes. Did you find it interesting? Mm-hmm. Do you know a bit more about oxen now? Yes. And do you have a newfound respect for them? Yes. Good. Anyway, thank you for listening. And um, let's run over where you can find us. So we are on... Twitter at Curie Child Pod. That's correct. We are on Facebook at Curie Child Pod. We are on Instagram at... Curie Child Pod. Yes. We... Oh, um, we also have a web. <laughs> we also have a website, thecuriosityofachild.com, where you can find all the latest show notes and things. And we might have maybe some interesting news, hopefully, to announce next episode as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a few things we're trying to put together, so fingers crossed they'll come to fruition. Something to look forward to. Yes. So thank you once again for listening, and we love you lots. Oh, and please review us. Mwah. Because Anson sent you a kiss, so now you have to review us. Because he doesn't give those away cheaply, all right? <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, and goodbye. Bye. No. On intact balls. Ah!